Extra Travelers, and welcome to another episode of Tales of Tavat, a Genshin Lore podcast. Last week, we dove into Fontaine and covered the start of our most recent swim throughout Tavat in our Fontaine So Far episode. Welcome to my favorite episode ever. We're talking about Jean, y'all, the dandelion night. Do you find yourself staring out the window? As you listen to this podcast, maybe blowing on a dandelion or wishing for romantic scenes to breeze by your huge, exhausted eyes. Well, welcome to TalesOfTavat.com, annihilator of younger, jealous sisters, protector of nations and Romancer of Deluxe. We got all the visuals you need. So head on over to our website. That's Tales of Tavat. Dot com. While you're on our site, make sure that you check out our past seasons and special episodes, artist spotlights from the community, wallpapers, including new Fontaine ones, and some of our favorite Genshin merch. Let us know what you think of this episode and what you'd like to see in the future by emailing us at talesofthebotpod at gmail.com, following us on Twitter, Tales of Tavat, or following us on Instagram, Tales of Tavat pod now (laughs) i feel like we're going back to like the very beginning of the game here by talking about Jean. she's our first woman in power that we really get to see and we get to see her right away yeah she's our first leader or if you're like me she was your first ever five star Uh and your first crush she was my first five star also oh shit look at you guys go i think she might have been mine as well (laughs) Before I knew what a five star was. Yeah, I was going to (laughs) say, I did not know that I had a five star, what a five star was and how I got her. So I'm pretty sure I did get her first because I remember trying her out Mm -hmm. and being like, oh, well, she's like wind, just like my main character that I already have. So why would I even bother with her? (laughs) Like never (laughs) use her. Little did we know. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and then you were like, oh shit, this is like the leader of this land. <laughs> Fast forward like, yeah, like three months. I was like, oh, she heals. <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> she can do insane damage as well. Yeah. Oh my God, I love her. I love I love her a lot. I need to build her better. Her artifacts are shit. <laughs> but I have luck on banners, not artifacts. <laughs> <laughs> you either get one or the other. I'm the opposite. Yeah, like, wait, this isn't really fair. I don't have luck on either how, <laughs> yeah. how does one get to choose which luck they have <laughs> when do the gods decide that uh, apparently you? you have to just pray to barbados i think you're just cursed cursed because no. you love child <gasps> oh <my laughs> i was God. gonna say did she have the conrean curse but damn the conrean curse the fontaine curse <laughs> the animo dead friends club curse like <laughs> i got all the curses it's fine <laughs> but what were your first impressions of Jean when you met her in the arc online? Because if I'm remembering correctly, the first time we meet Jean is when Kaya claps at us and then is like, you're going to come with me, little one. And he drags us over to Jean's office where we meet Jean and Lisa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. First thoughts? Uh, I just thought she was like, fine. Like, OK, like you're vanilla. You're kind of like, whatever. Oh, I came to appreciate her more later in case Al's having a, a meltdown. I am. I am actually. What the fuck? What the actual? But she just did it on the surface when you first meet her. Like, she just doesn't seem that interesting. She's like, okay, we're, we're in this fantasy realm. She looks like a, you know, white lady <laughs> with blonde hair that is telling everyone what to do. I don't know. It just didn't seem interesting to me. Have you ever watched that anime on Netflix about like the red panda? Like, she works in an office, and she's, like, a dedicated <gasps> hard worker. Yeah. Um... And then, yeah, after hours, she's, like, a screamo singer. Yes! Yes, our regrets go. Yes. Yeah, let's go. That's Jean. <laughs> I can't see her screaming, but maybe, like... Screaming at Klee? Writing romance fanfic. Oh, my God. The raunchiest fanfic. Oh, my of God. Of her and Dilu. No, Avira's Melancholy, which I read and I'm kind of mad. <laughs> so I I love that Genshin puts in these flavorful books. However, it picks up in multiple different places. So many things have happened in between a paragraph because it's supposed to be like, ah, oh, it's a full volume. And I'm so confused at what's happening. <laughs> I thought Vera... And Sachi were like great buds, and then he loves her, but 
she's in love her back. There's a full love square happening because then there's the princess who apparently was after Ike but is trying to eat or eat the eyeballs of Sachi, which means that they're in love and like, eat what is eyeballs. happening? <laughs> is this about perimantises? No. Well, that's what I... have I... no idea what y'all are talking about right now. Have you not read Vera's Melancholy? All, no, I have all not. Ten? <laughs> Do I have a thing for you? It's Jean's favorite book. It's her favorite series of all time and the insane thing is so in the first volume vera our protagonist aka like our gene put in here and vera is in the small town it's bumfuck nowhere nothing happens it's so boring a new person moves in his name is ike and he's over a thousand years old and one of the doors in his house is a door to anywhere in the universe you want to go wait is this about tina turner kind of (laughs) Kind of. No, Brandon. I mean, it sounds a lot like their story so far. That has not a good ending. Tina no. and I. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But but the the thing about it is, one, there's a door that can lead anywhere into the universe. And what do we walk through when we open up the game? A door. There's also the reference to old ones. Um, there are eldritch gods here. Eldritch horror in my Genshin Impact? I don't think so. And then we got in the realm that Ike is from, he took a two hour nap. And then gods and demons started a war, which what does that sound like? The Archon War. Oh, are you, mm. are you insinuating that uh, this book is something more? Wait, who wrote this book? That's the thing. I don't know for sure. I can't remember. It wasn't Alice. It's a dude. And after he published the 10th volume, he's like, fuck y'all, peace out. I'm not going to finish it. And he's like, no because Vera dies in the end and Sachi is like begging Ike to turn back time so he can like save the love of his life and Ike's Boiler like alert. I love her but I'm also <laughs> this thousand year old sage and emotions are nothing we don't know who wrote it no I don't I don't think I've ever seen the author yeah at least not an official name D- does the story involve nine realms no it involves the entire universe yeah there's a there's a lot of a lot of chatter online that this book actually has a big tie-in with Honkai. Wait, can we pause for a second? Tiff just brought up Honkai. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> There's a very thin line between love and hate. <laughs> I wrote it down and I went, ugh. <laughs> But yes, they say that there's a lot of references in the book to Honkai characters and Honkai. Oh, great. Well, now I have to read this. Yeah, now you have Ugh. to. It's 10 volumes, so oh have fun. Oh my god. All right. It's very quick. It pissed me off of how quickly they jump back and forth between, like, shit. I'm like, I need more context to enjoy this. I'm mad. Now, don't you feel like Jean should have a sword named Danielle Steele? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Jesus. Jesus. Uh, God, that was so bad. <laughs> You're welcome. I mean, I'm sorry, but like, Sino is like a cold sore. Like, he's just going with us. He's following yeah. us. He's, <laughs> like, he's just coming back out. God damn. I mean, God you act damn. like that's a bad thing. <laughs> well, I love him. We're going to have a dad joke counter soon. Please. I love that. I love it. You know, but in truth, though, instead of. <laughs> me stumbling over my words trying to find the smut authors of the world i would think she'd be more of a katie roberts fan (laughs) but either way smut yeah i don't know that author either (gasps) it's because you haven't read a lot of uh, monster fucker books (laughs) oh monster fucker books. you've not read enough (laughs) monster fucker books if you've not read the dragon's bride first of all fucker books is a great phrase (laughs) Don't worry, I'm working on it. (laughs) I'm working on it. Well, let's put this book back on the shelf. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know... Whoa, well, I heard a sigh. (laughs) It was more of a groan. Is it because of Honkai? (laughs) No, it's because I made another dad joke. Oh. (laughs) I didn't even notice. Anyway, we're going to put the book back on the shelf. And... I think it's a great time to mention, if you didn't catch on, that Jean loves <laughs> romance novels. And something I found very interesting is that Jean has a line in her one of her stories, like her character stories, where she says, like, she's yearning for something more, something like what's in her books. And then she's basically like, but can't have that. Gotta go back to work. Hashtag nights first. Mm hmm. Where's your thick dick okay. in this? Come on now. 
running away from his problems. Anyway, so I think it might be a little important to talk about the Knights of Favonius before we jump into Jean too much because Jean is the current acting grand master of the Knights of Favonius. So let me break that down for anyone. She isn't the grand master. She is just currently acting as the grand master and can make decisions on behalf of the current grandmaster who is Varka. Which I'm sure she was already doing. When yeah, I oh, yeah. think so. She was second in command and he was aloof. So she was, you know, kind of doing all of his job anyway. In one of Jean's character stories, Varka actually says to Jean when he tells her that she's going to take over, you already do this job anyway. I'm like, mm. you're admitting to it, yeah. sir? <laughs> He's like, I suck at this. So, hey. <laughs> Yeah, and something else that I find interesting about, like, the whole Varka gene, you know, everyone assumes that gene looks up to Varka, and for those of you who don't know, Varka is the current Grandmaster who we have not met in-game or in manga, which is crazy, but Varka... Varka, from Jean's perspective, like she feels that she had to clean up a lot after Varka and fix a lot of messes that he left. Additionally, Albedo even notes that Jean is a much better grandmaster and he hopes that she takes over. Yeah, agreed. Can we talk about some like thinly veiled chauvinism that's going on here? Because Varka is, first of all, he's described as a free spirited person. And there's this quote. That similar to the one that you were just talking about, Feeney, where Jean says, this is before Varka left, but Jean says, Grandmaster, please take your job seriously. <laughs> All of Mondstadt looks up to you. And Varka's response is, well, you are my second in command, so helping me out is a part of your job description. Ugh. This way, I can focus on the really important things. Wouldn't you agree? No. Oh my god. Like, are you freaking kidding me? Like... Ugh. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Like, I'm going to do man stuff while you take care of the house. Like, ugh. Yeah. I hate it. Meanwhile, Gene literally had to go in and clean up his fucking mess and get rid of Aerok for him. Yeah. I was about to say, yeah, didn't she (laughs) fire that fucker? Yeah. But we'll jump into Aerok and all that jazz in a minute. Let's talk a little bit about the Knights of Favonius. We have brought the Knights of Favonius up before. You know, we've talked about Kaya, D. Luke, Albedo, all members or ex-members of the Knights of Avonius. But I think what's really important to know is that the Knights are not only the governing force of Mondstadt, but also the policing force of Mondstadt. So they are both. They are the only people in charge, supposedly. Besides, I think Dawn Winery might be second in command at this point. (laughs) But Jean... It's a little mysterious as to what exactly Jean's title was prior to becoming acting Grandmaster. We do know it, don't we? She was um, Master of the Knights. She was Captain and then Master and then Grandmaster. Mika actually references her as a deputy at one point, but then he cuts himself off. There's a lot of confusion as to what Jean's title was prior to becoming acting Grandmaster. And even in the manga, when we meet Jean, she's already acting Grandmaster. So we really don't know. And I would be curious to know, too, if she was a captain, you know, because deputy or master could be just, like, side terms. I was the captain of the Calvary, and there's no Calvary. Well, yeah, you know what I mean? It's like calling someone a deputy or calling them a master could kind of be like a Ms. or Mrs. type of situation, where we know for a fact that captains hold a certain weight in the Knights of Avonius, because under the Grandmaster slash acting grandmaster there are eight captains of the knights of avonius we only know of five of them four of them we know kaya albedo herta eula and maybe that's it lisa's not a no she's just a librarian lisa was offered to be in charge of i believe the eighth infiltry but then gave up she was like nah i don't want that Like, time is precious. Time is precious, and these boobies are going to, you know, have fun themselves. Mm -hmm. But is there anything else about the Knights of Favonius that you guys think we might need to bring up? Yes, the Knights of Favonius was founded by Vanessa, who is Jean's role model, but also a very, very important person in the history of Mondstadt. 
which we've talked about her before. You know, she is the the person who was a slave at first when she was brought over into Mondstadt when the aristocracy was in charge. And then she led the rebellion against the aristocracy. And then she kind of started running shit. It's too bad you never saw images of that since you haven't read the manga, too. <laughs> I can see it all. I see it all in my head. I see it all. I know exactly what happened. I don't know if that's how this works. Yeah, I, it is. It's exactly... <laughs> I have an imagination. So Vanessa, the red-headed Vanessa. See, look, knew that. <laughs> Read no manga. <laughs> she ascended and actually left behind a little sapling of a tree as a token to people. And that is the giant tree we see in Windrise. For centuries, it's grown big and big and big. And that's why Jean goes to that tree often because she's speaking to Vanessa. We saw, we talked about in our Venti episode that Venti can actually only be healed over at that tree. Well, now... Can I just throw in that, like, maybe she just goes to that tree because she's been conditioned to by her abusive mother? <laughs> yeah. It literally, it's so sad. Like, Jean never had a regular birthday party or anything like that. Her mom just would bring her out to Windrise and be like, look at this. Yeah, no cake for you, just a big tree to look at. Yeah. So eventually when the knights throw Jean a little party and her story quest because she's been overworked and you know what does management do when you're overworked pizza party they throw her a party to try to make her feel better and she's kind of like what what is a party <laughs> i've never had these so sad yeah she she kind of had to grow up very quickly because of the conditioning for her mother was kind of raising her to be the successor of the Gunhilder clan so she was always learning and never got to go out and play and stuff like that and i think it's actually at the end of that story quest where she may i think it might be the end of that she says she understands when she used to always see this the, all the children playing in the street and like she'd be reading her book she never felt bad that she wasn't also doing that she was happy to be able to see it and know that she wanted to protect that and protect right. those kids, even as a small child herself. Or she was brainwashed by her mother. She's brainwashed. <laughs> the Gunhilder motto is... We're Mondstadt. As always. As always. I love to hear it as, for Mondstadt, as always. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the way Jean Truly says now. it. <laughs> the funnest fact about that motto too is it's mocked <laughs> in the Mondstadt taverns. There are people who are just like yeah, those gun tilders, they learn how to say that before they learn how to say mommy. Yeah. <laughs> it's like legend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, speaking of Jean's mom, the Alder Knight, Frederica. What's an Alder Knight? Evil. Wait, what does Alder mean? Isn't that a type of tree or something? That's actually her title's Alder, like A-L-D-E-R? Alder? A yeah, A-L-D-E-R. Oh, Oh, she's just a freaking tree. Yeah, she's a tree. Oh, is this about the teapot? Oh, not the teapot. <laughs> <laughs> is she named after the Windrise tree or something? Why do trees matter so much in this game? Because they steal from other mythologies. Yeah, I think that's something that they just like came about. Because I'm like, Alder Knight, there's Ash Knighthood. Hmm. I think it's going to have its own meaning one day down the line. I think that's really what it comes down to. You never know what Genshin's going to throw out. Yeah, That's I'm sure true. she has her own backstory that we were not aware of yet. It's like we're going to see in the next Genshin game. I mean, Gina's the Dandelion Knight. I mean, Alder Knight sounds way cooler than that. Well, not only is Jean the Dandelion Knight, but she's also the Lion Fang Knight. Yeah, but the Lion, Lion Fang, isn't that sort of passed down? The Dandelion Knight is passed down as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, is it? Okay. From generation to generation since Vanessa had the title. But, you know, that's the other cool thing, too, is Vanessa, while she was going through this, the liberating all the, the enslaved people and fighting the aristocracy, was known as the Lion Fang Knight. And then when she founded the Knights of Favonius, they started always just referring to her as the Dandelion Knight, even though she's got both titles. But it was kind of like going from this fierce kind of side as the Lion Fang, but also the more compassionate side of the Dandelion. And that actually becomes a bit of a of a motto as well for Jean that she kind of wants to follow that type of a... I think she actually wants to be more Dandelion Knight, but she she kind of understands both sides of that coin. 
But so she was raised by her mother. Yep, the Alder Knight, the tree. The Alder Knight, <laughs> Frederica, tree Frederica. She was raised by her to basically take on representation of the Gunhilder clan. And I remember back when we did the Barbara episode back in season one, we kept being like, where the hell is her mother? Because we didn't know. And lo and behold, we find out that she is actually currently on Varka's expedition. And this was revealed in an official Hoyolab post, which was uh, when Mika was released. And the quote is, I recruited Mika into the expedition team to hone his combat skills. As for why he reports directly to me, well, since Jean isn't with us, I needed someone trustworthy to deal with all the odd errands. Ha 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 ha. And <laughs> that is all in quotes. And then it says Varka's explanation to Alder Knight Frederica after a session of drinking. Oh my God. <laughs> I yeah. hate him. So he's like having a great time, like getting Mika to run his like weird little errands for him while Jean is running things. And he's yeah. telling this to Jean's mother. Doesn't that sort of, like, make you wonder, like, is Frederica, like, in Varka's ear? Like, oh, no, it's fine. Just let Jean do it. Yeah. Probably. With how much of a pageant mom she is. Like, I mean, forget Alice. This is high key. <laughs> yeah, Alice is just, like, aloof. Whereas Frederica seems, like... Suffocating. Well, just very, like, uh deliberate but where is this expedition did they go to like the archipelago or something like they're just like hanging out on the beach well they were seen in Notlon at one point right that's where they ran into capitano oh no they they went north i don't know if they went to snezhnaya that's what i thought they or did. if it was just like before snezhnaya but then they found out that capitano went to Notland. so i think that's sort of where they're going next ah. I think they're gonna follow him he went to the Natlan after they ran into him, right? I believe so. I could be wrong, but I think that's so. What's they're going like on. just trying to follow him around. I don't know if they're following him or they just happen to be going to the same place. You know, I really do hope though at some point this expedition does show up somewhere so we can actually find out what the hell they were and are doing. Well, it's kind of like when they sent Mika back out of nowhere, and you're like, damn it, we just get this character we've never met before, but then we fall in love with Mika, so it's okay. A little chocobo. And the letter that he sent with Mika. No, I'm assuming that this fandom wiki is correct. He explained how they met Il Capitano and that the Harbinger had been sent to Natlon, making use of the paper he had left. He also said, okay, so that's all That's all it says. So it could be assumed they either met Capitano on his way to Natlon or in Natlon. There's really no clear, concise answer. Um, when I picture Capitano like <laughs> going places in Tavat, I immediately like picture him as one of those like ring wraiths in Lord of the Rings where he just oh. kind of like floats around like kind of like ah. <laughs> they had that like metal like thing on their face too and okay so here's what Farka's letter says as Mika reads it. All right, now that your fears are allayed, I trust you'll be ready to listen to the rest of my letter. I'm writing to you from the northernmost reaches of Tavat by the light of a stove. The expedition forces are stationed here while we restock. I once told you that the purpose of this expedition was related to a dangerous secret from days long past. I am still unable to disclose more than this, but suffice to say that you needn't worry about how our mission is progressing. In the past couple of months, we received an unexpected visitor, the Fatui Harbinger known as the Captain. I am fully aware of the Fatui's outrageous actions and Mondstadt and recent history. Nevertheless, the Captain was not hostile towards us on this occasion. Open parenthesis, I rather suspect that's because this time Snezhnaya and we are in the same boat, close parenthesis. What does that mean? The man hides everything under the mask he wears so no one can know his past or his origins as of the Bloodstained Knight. However, one thing is for sure, <laughs> he is as hard as iron for having the courage to challenge gods as an ordinary mortal. I don't doubt that he could even take out a room guard by stabbing it in its big glowing eye with one of Klee's crayons. <laughs> Open parenthesis, don't get any ideas. Close parenthesis. <laughs> Our scouts have confirmed that the captain received orders to head to Natlon three days ago. We'll be able to sleep much better now that we don't need to worry about him anymore. I will admit that some of his actions have, have helped us, but even then, he owed us at least that much. Then it goes on to other stuff. Oh, by the way, Feeny, there's a PS. Ooh. My favorite. If you're wondering who's tougher between me and the captain, well, 
I'm the Grand Master. Ugh. And he says, there are 10 captains in the Knights of Favonius, oh, but only one Grand Master. <laughs> I hate him. <laughs> and that's one Grand ends. Master <laughs> and one acting Grand Master to keep your shit together. <laughs> okay, so my favorite part of the expedition is that not only is Frederica on the expedition, but so is her ex-husband, Seamus Pegg. Yes. Like, the drama that must be happening on that expedition. Like, are they hooking up again? Is there another <laughs> blonde-haired, blue-eyed baby that's coming from Onstead? Is there oh, another no. sister in the fam? A third baby. <laughs> Frederico would probably kill him. She'd be, like, in the middle of the night, like, just like, like, boop, I'm just gonna put some poison into you. Drink here, buddy. I feel like Seamus Pegg, though, would protect Varka, and that's an issue, Yes. Too. Is that because he's a man of the church? Well, yes and no. <laughs> so we talked a lot about Jean's mom. For our travelers who don't know, Jean's father is Seamus Pegg. Now, you may recognize the name Pegg because that is Barbara's last name as well. For travelers who don't know, we did a whole episode on Barbara in season one, like Brendan mentioned earlier, but... Barbara and Jean are sisters, and when their parents split up when they were younger, each parent took a sister with them. So Jean went with Frederica, took on the Gunhilder name. Barbara went with Seamus Pegg, took on the Pegg name. Because they're great parents. Isn't this how the parent trap happened? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the parent, so the, the whole reason for the expedition was like Barbara <laughs> orchestrated the whole thing <laughs> to try to get her parents back together. Yes, that's literally <laughs> what's happening. Seamus Pegg is currently the central of the Church of Mondstadt, aka the Cardinal of Daybreak. That is his other nickname. And that's how we meet him in the manga. He is at the party that Diluc is running. He also, in the manga, has the conversation with Dottore, Kaya, and Diluc. Then we see a flashback to him later that night being, like, super drunk. And Kaya's, like, walking him home. And he's like, I did it! I kicked Dottore out! Yeah! And Kaya's like, "Mm -hmm, mm-hmm, (laughs) mm-hmm. Whatever you say. But prior to becoming... Seneschal. Mm. The Seneschal of the Church of Mondstadt. He actually was a traveler and he later settled in Mondstadt where then he joined the church. And I think that's really interesting because that suggests that he's not necessarily from Mondstadt either. Do you think that the backstory could be that Frederica is more cutthroat and Seamus is more gentle and harmonious? Because he seemed very nervous in the manga when conflict arose and just in general really i think when seamus was first like an adventurer he was probably a little more wild and free and like more willing to take on a fight and i think that's why him and frederica got along like they were both spicy Mm -hmm. and then they had the kids and he joined the church i think that he softened like you're saying and he might have realized that there are other ways to come about things because he is the one who taught barbara to heal Mm -hmm. so he must have become a healer at some point and taken on like you said these softer motives so i'm very curious if he's on the expedition as a healer or was varka like you got to be that sassy bitch again and come fight with us Mm. i really want to know more about their backstory because maybe he did something terrible that turned him away from violence or something and then frederica is like well I got a name to uphold, so I'm going to take our daughter that is more well-suited to to violent combat and teach her the way. You can take our more gentle daughter and like teach her you know, how to heal or whatever, but there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff going on in that whole storyline that we don't know yet. Is it bad that I have a theory about Frederica just used Jameis to get her pregnant? <laughs> I mean, it's totally possible. And, and the reason I say this is because... As I do, I look at the IRL references or like real translations of of names, words, you know, like in the Sino episode, I learned or I looked up the Mahamatra just to see if there was actually a real life parallel and there was. So I looked up Gunhilder and I got into the sagas, y'all, which in Norse mythology, and it's also possible that she was a real person it's a bit unclear because the sagas you can't really take them verbatim but there is some evidence that someone maybe not of the same name but of the same story existed 
there was a woman, her name was Gunhilder, but a lot of people call her Gunhild. And she was the wife of Eric Bloodaxe, and she was considered the mother of kings. And she had a lot of sons. She was married to the king of Norway and, you know, very bloody, very, very much a battle situation during this Scandinavian period. And she was a cutthroat bitch. I think at a certain point she <laughs> she was like, uh, oh, this one kid? No, nah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna back my other kid, type of a thing. But when you translate Gunhilder, you get Battle Maiden, which makes a lot of sense. And I have I have a sneaking suspicion that Frederica kind of just used Seamus to get heirs. And mm. when she found that Jean was probably the most malleable to her goal she chose gene and was like fuck off everybody i'm gonna i'm taking my daughter and you can have this one which is really upsetting i mean we do know that frederica does have a little bit of a relationship with her daughter because she sent her a cute dress but it's not in the same capacity that she would have with her father now do we think that it's possible that gene isn't actually seamus pegg's daughter yes i absolutely absolutely i don't know why what if she's varka's daughter yeah (laughs) i would not be surprised i'd kind of be a little upset because it's like is that why frederica and seamus split up that's possible yeah i mean the gene could also be like the one that frederica took she is the older sister we see that a lot in you know even in english royalty where it's you know it's the eldest gets the good stuffs so for her that's gonna be gene who obviously would also be a lot more advanced than barbara because you could tell that well while we don't know their exact ages we could tell that there's an age difference between them so you know a sweet young little girl probably didn't even have the chance to become the heir you know her mom was probably just like fuck that i want this one and Mm -hmm. that's it and that's why she is constantly plotting gene's death (laughs) (laughs) yeah barbara and gene have a interesting situation because we they know they know each other they know their siblings they have a lot in common but they both get really shy about trying to start a relationship with one another and it's because their dumbass parents separated them so now they're here they are in mondstadt without their parents and they could really use one another and they're both like 14 year old kids like i don't know how to talk to a friend (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> i mean there could be half siblings too like with the idea that gene's not seamus's but barbara is his and they broke up due to due to that fiasco i will say it's like maybe not the best theory just because we know what seamus looks like we don't know what frederica looks like but we do know seamus is blonde i think he has blue eyes doesn't he he's like wearing glasses we can't see his eyes dumb dumb i hate him so yeah <laughs> We don't know, but they could both be, you know, blonde. That's true. I will say, though, Jean and Barbara definitely have a relationship. And whether or not that's growing or not, you know, maybe it's changing over time. You know, Barbara openly admits in her voice line, she's like, when will I be tall like my big sister? They do shy away in their voice lines about one another. But in one of Barbara's birthday letters she actually talks about feeling like she hit a plateau in her life and she went to Jean to get advice on how to grow and prosper and how to get past the plateau so i mean they know enough to go to one another for that type of thing yeah i think in public they're a little more ashamed and i have a feeling that's probably because their parents didn't tell people that they were siblings because they knew they did some dumb shit by splitting them up yeah so i think it's more of like the public I I could even see Frederica being the one like, don't let anyone know you're related. Don't let her know you're my daughter. But then Frederica's also trying to have a relationship with Barbara, so it's very confusing. Well, she feels guilty for being a pageant mom to only one of her (laughs) kids. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So she's like, oh, well, I made you this dress. Here you go. Yeah, she's like, oh, wait, this other one has some talent with something? Maybe I should have paid attention. She's like, wait, Alice is trying to be my other daughter's pageant mom? I don't think so. Yeah, like, Mm -hmm. I gotta stop put a stop to this <laughs> only one pageant mom and mom's dad at a time <laughs> and then on the and then alice is like she's like on earth watching dance moms and it's like mm, i see what's going on here yeah <laughs> <laughs> 
for those who might not remember from our Barbara episode, Alice is the one who encouraged Barbara to become Tvet's next big singer. And Barbara is a pop singer as well as a deaconess of the church and healer. But yeah, it's all Alice was... Alice has tried to get a lot of people to sing and basically she wants to create American Idol in Tavat. Mm-hmm. To that idol. Tavat idol, yeah. Let me tell you though, did you guys know that Jean can also sing? Yeah. Does, isn't she like kind of embarrassed about it though? I did not. Yeah, in the teapot, you can go up to her and she talks. Oh, talk- well, that'd be so sweet if they s- sang a song together. A little duet. I don't remember what exactly prompts it in the teapot, like if Jean is humming or something, but it's one of the options where Jean admits that she's a good singer and you kind of are like, well, sing me a tune. And she's like, don't put me on the spot. Oh, poor baby. Yeah, and Fiends and I had a little theory on this too. Yeah, she might be a great singer and it might be awesome to hear her sing with Barbara, but also, is she actually better? Better than Barbara. So she's like, I'm not going to sing because it's going to make my sister feel like, oh, crap. She's going to hate me even more. She took another thing from me. First, it was mom. <laughs> then it was D. Luke. <laughs> now it's my entire persona. And there's a lot of competition there. I mean, the fact that they're both healers, which I'm assuming comes from their father. The fact that they are both kind of big deals in Mondstadt. They can both sing. I mean, Barbara seems jealous of the height, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which also makes me question what the age difference is, because like, is Barbara closer in age to Jean than we know? And that's like, she's like, what the fuck? Why aren't they tall? Yeah, (laughs) she's got like Sayu's kind of. Yeah, she's like, don't pat me on the head. (laughs) I can grow seven inches. How come everybody's taller than me? (laughs) I mean, we know for sure that Barbara didn't grow up like interacting with Kaya and D. Luke. So I do think there is a significant age gap. It's more along the lines of like, you know, when you're a kid and you're with your friends and then you're, I don't, why am I the one? I'm an only child. I have no siblings, but like, you know, when younger kids come around, they're like, can I play? And he's like, fuck <laughs> no kid. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I've definitely been the kid that was told, no, you can't play. <laughs> oh, I would have played. Thank you. <laughs> Same. I'm a younger sibling. Mm-hmm. Same thing. But it feels kind of like that. I want to take things back a little bit and go back to a little bit about Jean, her family aside. You know, we talked a little bit about her being in the nights. And because of her being in the nights, she has kind of gotten a chosen found family. And some of those people in that found family include Miss Lisa. Big titty mommy. What are our thoughts on Lisa and Jean? They're either wives Mm-hmm. Or wives. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here's the thing. I love them together as a couple, but I also love that they are like the best duo the knights will ever have. Mm-hmm. That's true. I feel with them, they... <laughs> well, well, I know we say it a lot with Venti that he knows more than he's telling us. They know more than they're telling us. And I think that Lisa has a lot more authority in Mondstadt than a librarian sounds like she would. Yeah. I always think back to the first time when we did meet them in Jean's office. They say something very sus before we walk in. And it's like they had some crazy plan to get us in there. And it just kind of always sat with me. And I, I apologize that I can't think of the exact quote right now. It was basically our plan is working, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, like, and it was like, what, what are you talking about? And it never really goes back to it. And I think that there's something... They know a lot more. And as we found throughout Tavat, there's just a lot of strong women who are in power throughout the whole Mm -hmm. thing. And I think that, you know, Lisa definitely has a lot more in there than Gibbon. Yeah, I I think of Lisa as the silent partner of Mondstadt. Like she runs 50% of Mondstadt, but she doesn't want anyone to know that. So she just sort of tells Jean, you know, all of her thoughts and like what she would do. Everyone knows Lisa has a lot of potential and she could do a lot, but she chooses not to. But I think that she cares about Jean and she's sort of like, you know, she knows how clever she is and that she's useful. So she's like helping Jean do stuff and like they're working together sort of in a partnership. But that the agreement is that no one knows that Lisa's doing it because she doesn't want that attention. She's the Yalon of Mondstadt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's a good way to put it. I will say I agree where I see Lisa and Jean as 
co-conspirators of sorts because Jean actually says that when Lisa is around, she feels much more at ease, almost Mm. like, you know, you got your bestie there with you. And on top of that, the two of them are actually the ones who worked together, worked together to get Inspector Arrow disposed of. (laughs) (laughs) Disposed disposed of. Um, They got him. Yeah, they got rid of him. Yeah, yeah. So, but they twi- didn't actually dispose of him, right? Like he did. They didn't kill him. No, they just got. They kicked him out. <laughs> Tiff, your sh- your Italian showing. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> they disposed of him. Oh, that's like, they killed him. <laughs> yeah, that was. A, come on, <laughs> Italian. I'm from Jersey. This is exactly what that means. <laughs> For our travelers who are like, who is Eric, and what are they talking about? Back in ye old manga, we find out that when Diluc's dad, Krapus, died, he remember he died when his delusion backfired, slash when his delusion backfired and Diluc had to kill him, depending on how you look at the story. Diluc found out that the knights were going to cover up the story of how Krapus died. And despite the fact that Krapus died a hero who was trying to protect Mondstadt, from Ursa the Drake, they were like, no, we're going to say that he just died in like a fire and that's it because we don't want to bring that attention here and we don't want to showcase that a mere businessman has that type of power. Like, it'll make the knights look bad. And Aarok is the one who makes that decision. And that's when Diluc says, well, fuck this shit, I'm out. Leaves his uniform, leaves his vision, leaves Mondstadt. (laughs) Does a lot of leaving. Does Arak also try and take the responsibility, like, kind of be like, oh, I protected it. Like, not only did it not be him, but, like, I did it. Yes, so Arak does take credit for getting rid of Ursa in the moment. We all know that eventually Tatore is the one who, quote-unquote, kills Ursa the Drake. I got a lot of questions about that. But, (laughs) yes, Arak does take credit and says that, like, he's the reason that Ursa was, like, gotten rid of that day. Like, he's the reason Monset was safe. And sometime down the road between Krapus's death and the manga starting, Jean and Lisa actually open an investigation into it. And like I'm, I imagine them being very like Detective Paimon about it. Oh, I wish they I hope they had the glasses. <laughs> they probably did. Everyone gets glasses. <laughs> Wait, so Eric is still alive? Yeah. So Jean and Lisa do this investigation and they bring the information to Master Barca. And Varka gives Jean and Lisa permission to handle the matter in whatever way they see fit. Of course he does. Yeah, of course, because Jean's already in charge at that point, right? <laughs> and he's just like... A man. Yeah. <laughs> no offense, Brandon. <laughs> and Jean and, Jean and Lisa decide that they're basically going to kick him out of the Knights of Favonius, which they do. Now, there is no word on whether or not Aerox stayed... In Mondstadt, if he left Mondstadt, if he's dead, if he's now a Fatui Harbinger, like, we don't fucking know. But on top of that, Jean actually mentions that there was a lot of negative feedback from within the Knights of Favonius who were supporters of Aarok. So it almost makes it sound like he was kind of forming his own, like, little sanction within the Knights. And Jean mentions that when she takes over as the acting grand master, she's still dealing with some of those pressures. Yeah, like some like the like sympathizers of Era. Those assholes. Right. Yeah, which like what? Like if you're a knight, you should just listen to the other knights. Like I don't like one guy, really. I have a lot of questions about that. I thought whoever was the betrayer died. Who am I thinking of in the knights? Was I thought it was Eric that was like the the shady betrayer. Was there someone else? Because I thought someone got I thought someone died or like, got exiled and then murdered or something? Jean discovered the scheme and reported it to Varka, who conferred her with the authority to punish him as saw fit. When D. Luke returned four years later from his investigation, he learned that Eric had been discharged as a traitor. His status is currently unknown. That, okay, I must have been assuming. So, yeah, it, it must be Eric I'm thinking of. Although his allies continue to attempt to subvert the knights from within. Mm. Also, just saying, too, Eric, we don't ever see his face. But in my opinion, he kind of looks like he could beat Tatore. Oh. Got some muscle on him a little bit. Well, I mean like the Tatore that's in the manga. Like that segment. And I think that would be interesting because that segment does take credit for getting rid of Ursa the Drake. 
Now, I'm not going off of much. Um, you know, I am going off of the fact that I can see his, like, torso. I can see a ring. And I can see, like, the very bottom of his hair. I like where you're going with this. Yeah, it, and it doesn't need to look anything like Dottore because remember the whole Scaramouche storyline where he was pretending to be someone from Fontaine. Yeah, he could look like anyone, I guess, and make up a different name. <laughs> Well, I mean, it would make sense if he's taking credit for killing Ursa, and we know that Dottore did that. Also, it's interesting because the ring on Aerox's finger kind of looks like it could be a delusion. Because if you look at, like, the, the one that Krapis has, like, it looks like a vision, but you could barely see a pyro sign on it. Where I, yeah, Al, I feel like that could maybe be like a hidden hydro symbol. Wait, I'm trying to think of like if Dodore has a ring on when we see him in Sumeru. It's hard though, because you can't really compare like the Dodore that we see in game because it is different segments. So like, you know, I went through a ring phase. It's right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's right now. It's right, right now. <laughs> but I also Love went it. through a watch phase, you know, where like for a few years I did not leave my house without a watch on. I don't wear a watch anymore. So it was, you know, different segments, different styles, different times, <laughs> different phases. I do wish, Brandon, from what I can tell, we really can't see uh, Dottore's like hands or anything mm-hmm. in the manga, which is like very frustrating, of course. But who knows? It's totally a possibility. Or it could totally be like some other member of the Fatui as well. I mean, we just got smacked with that in Fontaine, did we not? Mm hmm. Smacked right upside the head. <laughs> it also would make sense if it was a Fatui member because they're still trying to quote unquote uproot the knights from inside, from yeah. like within. Mm hmm. And we know that the Knights are really the only group that di- hasn't partnered with Shneznaya. We know that Lee Wei signed a contract, gave it right over. We know same thing with Inazuma, same thing with Sumeru. All those gnosises were handed over. They cooperated. But in Mondstadt, Senora literally had to sucker punch Venti and freeze his feet to the ground to get it. No one handed that over. I mean, Venti might have handed it over, but not seemingly <laughs> on the behalf <laughs> of the, the Fatui. <laughs> but we also know that the Fatui was trying to infiltrate the Shumatsuban too. So there's already a precedence for it that we know in black and white. So it wouldn't be that strange to think that they're trying to infiltrate other strong alliances and, you know, something like the, the Knights of Fabonius. Right. So I'm going to backtrack this though, back to Jean. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. She out. Uh, I was going to say, Al's in the corner, like, yes, my love. So Jean in the manga is dealing with the entire Blackfire incident. She is in charge of trying to figure out what the fuck is happening. Of course, I think Kai is really the one who puts two and two together with Kale, but that's fine. Yeah, the black fire, just to, as a reminder, that's the fire that Kale started that killed the Shaznayan diplomats. Yeah, it's sort of like the manifestation of the god energy that was within her body Okay, that Sino ended up sealing. Okay, thank you. Because of the Totoro. And so in the manga, Jean really has to be that front-facing person. And that's, I think, why Kaya kind of figures it out first, because Jean is really busy dealing with what is Barnabas? the Fatui that is sent to deal with the fact that the two people died. Like, he's an ass, Barnabas. And Jean is really the one who has to sit in an office with him and be like, we're sorry. We're working on it. Like, lots of politicianing by Jean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we see that in the Archon storyline for Monsa as well, where Jean is really trying to deal with the Storm Terror Crisis while also dealing with the Fatui showing up again. Because the Fatui have quote-unquote deemed Mondstadt unable to handle the situation, and they've decided that they need to come help. It's almost like they're deja vuing themselves to Ursa the Drake. (laughs) And Jean is the one who's getting a lot of pressure all around her to figure out what the heck is happening. Yeah, and it's really, it's it's an interesting part of Jean that we don't see a lot of in the game as much as in the manga where, I mean, we see a little bit of it in the game, but she very much plays the game of politics where she will kiss their ass 
to whatever degree needs to happen while still holding power. Mm-hmm. And I remember in, in the manga, she like buys time for them to do an investigation, like her and Lisa and Amber. So she's really good at that role. Like she's not just as, um, you know, kind of like wistful and innocent and like, oh, I have to do all this stuff. Like she's actually like really clever and sharp and ambitious about it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I think too, one of my favorite parts about Jean comes from the arc online where she is trying to figure out what to tell the public about Storm Terror. And that's why they go out to Star Snatch Cliff. She's like, we need to be far, far away from the city. I don't want the people to know that we are fixing Storm Terror right now in case it goes wrong. She's like, we need to just tell the public that it's been handled when it's been handled. And that's also why she really only works with D. Luke in the manga. Oh, is that the only reason? reason. I feel like there's another. Yeah, I mean, Dick Rock is right next to Rinwise. Why don't we take a second, actually... (laughs) <laughs> to talk about D. Luke and Jean. They have turtles. Turtles! They had turtles as kids. Their family lines go back into ancient history together. hmm They might be related. No, I'm just kidding. No! <laughs> surprise! I mean, they actually incest. might be, but... <laughs> we haven't had a surprise incest in a very long yeah, time. Yeah, that's, that's true. true. We haven't. Wow. <laughs> but for me... <laughs> I love the Diluc Jean relationship. As we know, though, I am biased because in my fan fiction, I had them dating prior to Diluc leaving Mondstadt. That's not biased. That's just truth. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like there's really a lot of suggestion in their voice lines and everything about one another that like there's something going on. Like they have a situation ship minimally. So for the fall like Oktoberfest art that came out that Genshin um people analyze that so <laughs> fucking hard <laughs> with D Loop looking at Jean who's looking toward you know the audience and there's sunflowers on the table meaning love and I'm like oh my god y'all I mean <laughs> I'm hardcore shipping them mostly because I don't know, man. I I just really like that ship. I mean, the sa- same thing with like Kave and Al Haytham. I love that ship to death, but it's so fucking good. Maybe it's just all the smut, all the really good smut. Well, I feel like in the beginning, like when we first kind of see them interact, I think it's maybe it's an angel share where we kind of see them first kind of together. There's a little bit of a oh well what do you yeah we know that yeah we we we've had this history like they have a little flirting or they almost try and stop each other from saying something else so it's one of the ones i feel like the game actually tries to tell you about without telling you Mm -hmm. and that's for me who's now officially unshipping everybody i still ship them (laughs) wow you know tip you don't seem to be very steadfast on this whole not shipping anything thing Uh-huh. I have no, they're the ones that the game really pushes. I'm on a hundred percent. D Luke, Jean, Beto, and Ningguang, and Traveler and Child. Oh. Oh, oh no. what? Thank you, Tip. We can end the podcast now. <laughs> yeah, for good. We're ending it yeah, for we're good. Done. We're done. <laughs> Sorry, guys. This is the last episode of Tales of the Bond. They have done so much to make that child and Lumine, at least, because that's who I play. Well, I guess it would be it was be Aether as well, because, hey, same thing. Here's a little spoiler for you all. It, I do plan on having child and Lumine together in my fan fiction <laughs> when child gets reintroduced as alive, <laughs> which is a whole long story. But this is the point. D. Luke and Jean, in my opinion, is totally like the first hardcore ship. And I think, Tiff, you bring up an awesome point about they about how they first interact with one another. D. Luke actually has two voice lines about Jean and vice versa. They have two voice lines about one another, which is always, you know, whoa. <laughs> but, well, anytime someone... Like there's a reason. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there must be be a reason but Diluc does mention that he thinks Jean is like too dedicated to her responsibilities and that it's keeping her from finding her true self and her true 
passion. It's funny because he's like, you know, the, the dark knight hero or whatever. And so he's sort of like the good guy, but he's also the bad boy because he's kind of like, I left the knights and I do what I want. And she's like, I have to take care of the knights and I have to like be responsible. And he's like, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> I also think it's interesting because Jean is quite aware of like D. Luke's feelings. In one of her voice lines, she says that she gets why he's so like critical of the knights. And she even says like, what happened with Aerok? It sucks. And I hate that it happened, but it's in the past. And, you know, all I can do is keep working hard in the hopes that one day he may see us, <clears throat> me, in a better light. But it's very mm -hmm. almost like romantic. She also mentioned, you know, that D. Luke is her senior, but he that she has the utmost respect for him. And even though they have gone separate ways, she can sense that they still share the same commitment to protecting Mondstadt. They also hold a secret together. They both know Venti's true identity. Mm -hmm. And they are the only ones in Mondstadt besides us who know that. That we know of. I think of him sort of like Lisa, and I, it makes sense why she shipped with both of them. Because she keeps him in the loop on things and is sort of like her silent advisor. And they kind of share, you know, a little bit of the responsibility of protecting Mondstadt in their own ways. You know what I find interesting, too, is I and I don't actually know if this is anywhere <laughs> in the game or the manga or if I'm just making this up and it's my own headcanon. But headcanons usually come from something. But I feel like a lot of times Jean uses Kaya as like her like messenger boy for D. Luke. She's like, hey, go tell D-Luke this. Hey, go do that. Kaya's always like, I'm here on official business. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's funny, too, because Jean totally knows about the rift between them. And, and you know, there's a lot of fan thoughts and headcanons that when Kaya got injured that night, when D-Luke, like, you know, snapped and almost killed him and blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of headcanons that, you know, Kaya probably went to Jean and you know, as co-workers and not knowing what to do. So mm. Jean, regardless of if that's true or not, I do think knows the truth of what happened between the boys, the brothers. See, I wouldn't expect him to do that. I would expect him to run away and be alone. Well, he had to heal somehow. And, oh. and you know, well, I'm saying Jean's a healer. Like, so it makes sense to go to someone, you know, you can trust. And, you know, Al was talking a little bit earlier about how we know Barbara didn't hang out with the Ragvinger brothers. But Jean did, right, Al? But yeah, because we get the turtle scene. Yeah, the turtles. Oh my god, Al, tell us about the turtles. Oh my god! So, they say turtles. I think they mean tortoises, because... So, D. Luke and Jean both had pet turtles. I just know it's a reptile that they both had, and it was really <laughs> cute. It's also, like, the most random thing. It is so random, and also... Just like, I don't know, something really cute to bond over. It's like, oh, we got pet tortoises, like pet reptiles. We're, we're a small community, but we're very strong. <laughs> Al says that she like strokes Azdaha. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> They're hiding now. But yeah, that's it's oh, insanely cute. Because like kids being silly kids and like, you can kind of see that this is like the beginning of like, do you look love? And it's like, oh, I also kind of feel like Frederica would kind of push them together as well, because both being like, you know, we know the history of their families. We know from our Venti episode, too, when we were talking about when Decorabium was being overthrown, there's in that cutscene that we see, there's a, an assumed, you know, the red red hair like D. Luke. We also can assume that there's or we know that there's a gun Hilder like. Well, actually, <laughs> now that no, now that you bring it up, I actually have a correction to make a, from the Venti episode. Oh, <gasps> a retraction? A retraction, yes. <gasps> <laughs> the first Tales of Tavai official rejection. Okay, official this retraction. is the only mistake in lore that we've ever made in <laughs> three like seasons. That's the only <laughs> one. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic. So when we did the uh, the Venti episode earlier this season, we were describing the uh, Decarabian battle where there's like a cast of characters, if you will, that attacks Decarabian. And we know that Venti was there. We know that uh, the, the Bard was there. We know that Amos, who is the elf, was there. And then the way that it was described, and I, I think I, I don't know if I misread it. I, I think I probably just misread it, but I read some, you know, info that said that there was a knight and flame-haired warrior, and 
I thought that it was implied that those were two separate people, but I think it was the same person that oh. the knight and flame haired warrior were one and the same. So the flame haired warrior was a knight. And so that was the Ragan vendor person that was there. But when I went back to, to look at it again, I couldn't find any evidence of a, a Gunhilder. And to sort of back that up, when you look at the cutscene of that fight that Venti goes over and I believe his, is it his story quest? Yes, it is his story quest. Yeah. So there you see Amos, like the blonde elf with the bow. You see the redhead with the goatee, which would be the Ragenvender. You do not see anyone that could be a, a Gunhilder. Mm, okay, interesting. And we know kind of from the, the house emblems kind of showcase the original or at least those that were a part of the fight yeah you you can't see the figure who's representing the gunhilder clan in, in the sigil or their in their crest yeah and just to for people that are like what are y'all talking about <laughs> for history I, and we went over this in the barber episode but for anyone that didn't listen to it 3000 years ago there was this war between this overlord named decarabian he was fighting with the as we know him now the ghost wolf andreas so they were just the god of storms and the god of uh whatever andreas is the god of fighting and not um people yeah, yeah not, not people, people. <laughs> and it was creating this like fierce blizzard the gunhilders were around all the way back then three thousand years ago they had a patriarch who served under decarabian but then he and they had a patreon <laughs> a patreon <laughs> Like they had a Patreon. What were they doing Patreon. on there? A patriarch. Like, Did I say Patreon? No, no, no that's no. what I heard. <laughs> no, you, you're fine. Okay, so they had a patriarch who served under Decarabian, and he and his clan eventually got sick of Decarabian's shit because he basically became a tyrant. So they were like, let's leave. But then, you know, they went outside and realized that everything in Mondstadt is like the Ice Age because of Andreas trying to fight with Decarabian constantly. So there's like a wind and ice and snow and everything. So they're in a blizzard, basically. And the chief's daughter, or the uh, leader of the Gunhilder's daughter, she started praying for help. And that combined with the people's prayers attracted a wind spirit, which I think is pretty safe to say was probably Venti. Yeah. And uh, Venti created a shelter for the clan and basically gave some kind of special power to the daughter to protect the people, to protect the Gunhilders. So he sort of gave this like magical power to the, the Gunhilder clan from the beginning, which is really interesting when you think about some of the other family lines or regional bloodlines in this game that have like, you know, curses and things tied to them. So anyway... Uh, when her father, the chief, died, this daughter became the new Gunhilder. She was like Lady Gunhilder, and she became a matriarch. And she was like this priestess who led the clan. And so when Barbados did, you know, when Venti finally did actually challenge Decarabian and took the bard and Amos the elf and the Ragenvinder and went into battle against Decarabian, Lady Gunhilder actually did lead her people to fight alongside them. So they might not have been in that actual confrontation with Decarabian, but they, they were fighting the good fight overall in that, that you know, war. Which is interesting. Like, way back then, they kind of were taking charge, and then the Gunhilders kind of continued to be those people in charge after Vanessa. And it's like, how'd they get so good? So... <laughs> I might have another retraction or correction. So during Vanessa's rebellion, when the people of Mondstadt, we all know that Vanessa sort of led this rebellion where the, the people of Mondstadt rose up against this toxic aristocracy, right? Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, most of that toxicity was from the Lawrence clan. The Gunhilders, they actually took the side of the people. So they, for that reason, you know, for the, you know, when the people rose up, they were like, no, we're on your side. We're going to help you take down the Lawrence clan. And for that reason, they were actually spared exile like the rest of the aristocracy and i'm assuming that that's because vanessa sort of took pity on them because vanessa at that time became the leader that's when she established the knights of Havonius. she exiled the lawrence clan because they're evil but because the gunhilders even though they were a part of the aristocracy they got spared that exile now i'm getting this from this book called the biography of gunhilder which is in the game that you can read it says that when they were spared the sentence of exile it says that that was imposed on the rest of the aristocracy so i have a 
couple points to make about this. The first one is that it's really interesting that Vanessa overthrew the aristocracy, which the Goonhilders were a part of, mm -hmm. and that now Jean sees Vanessa as her hero. Like, I just find that interesting, you know? Well, I mean, think about it. It's like this idea of being the heir of the Gunhilder clan it's kind of ruined a lot of her childhood and her life. Yeah. It's almost like her like a, a mini rebellion inside her you know what i mean right hell yeah like i love that she overthrew the aristocracy my family was a part of that and she was like just being free so i could see um gene sort of being like oh yeah that would be nice <laughs> to be free and not like care about the grand family of Mostat. anyway there's this another point i wanted to make which was if the Goonhilders were spared exile which was imposed on the quote-unquote rest of the aristocracy does that mean that the Ragenvinder clan was exiled because they were one of the founding families of Mondstadt and like one of like the most prominent families of Mondstadt? They're described that way. I thought I remembered reading that they were also excluded from exile. So I would find it unlikely, and I'm going to tell you why. I do find it kind of interesting that they would say the rest of the aristocracy without bringing them up. But we know, so first of all, we know that there's that ancient Ragenvinder, probably a Ragenvinder from 2,600 years ago during the Decarabian battle. Well, apparently there was another Ragenvinder who was sort of famous a thousand years ago when Vanessa had her rebellion throughout the Lawrence clan. And this is the Ragenvinder, and I'm getting this from the Favonius Codex lore. So when Vanessa founded the Knights of Favonius after the rebellion, the Dawn Knight Ragenvinder, which was this title, and I guess he was a squire, he actually turned the former aristocrats' indoor baths, which I think is hilarious because they had bathhouses, into a library, which later grew into the largest library uh, in the northern half of the continent, which, Feeney, you've mentioned before, you brought up this grand library, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that the one Enjo burned down? Yep. Yeah, it did burn down, but a Ragenvinder is the one who created it back in Vanessa's time. It didn't grow into like this grand library until later, but he's the one that created it. So I do find it kind of unlikely that the Ragenvinders were exiled just because of this, because there was some kind of squire Ragenvinder who was, you know, a noble person allowed to own land, was at least in somewhat in Vanessa's ear to like get her to let him create a library. And then the library burns down and what's called the, quote, Great Fire of Fall Equinox, end quote. But one thing that I was not aware of when I was looking into this about this library is that there's this large wooden door in the library, and it withstood that fire that burned most of it down, but it's said to predate the founding of the library, and it predates the Knights of Favonius. Oh, shit. And the Knights refer to it officially as the restricted section of the library, but, Ooh. quote, tales tell of a far more profound secret hidden within, end quote. Mm. So it's still in the library, that door? It, yeah. There's something in the library huh. that we haven't seen yet. It's so European of them. <laughs> what could it be? A portal to Celestia? A Conrian access point? I think it's forbidden knowledge. Mm. Maybe. I think that's why Lisa's, you know, clock is ticking down. What if that's why Lisa's there? She's already clicking down, so she could guard it with all her life. Or what if she's trying to figure out how to open the door? Right, that's also, I mean, someone has the key. Well, we don't know. I mean, who knows? A fire couldn't burn it down. True. Pre we know that it predates the Knights of Favonia, so it was there before they got there. Right, that's true. And so it predates Vanessa, even. It must predate the bathhouses. And that's a lot of gay sex to sit through. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, also, the only other uh, clan, this is my other retraction. <laughs> I think when we talked about the Lawrence clan in our, what was that, third episode? We also originally cited that the Immenlocker clan was one of the founding families of Mondstadt. And I think we sort of assumed that that was a part of the aristocracy. But when I was looking back into this today, I couldn't find any proof of that other than just certain websites sort of saying it. But when I actually looked, there is an argument to be made that they might have been a founding clan of Mondstadt, but I couldn't find anything implying that they were a part of the aristocracy because I was wondering if maybe they got exiled and that's why we don't know anything about them currently. Mm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but where's 
the Umanlocker clan also the Wanderers troop? No. So the remember the original Umanlocker, the outsider who went to Salvin Dagner. Oh yes, yes, yes. He was like the hero that like came to the mountain from outside, and then he left to go search for help, and then he came back, and everyone was dead. <laughs> <laughs> so he left again. Oh my god, why did I laugh at that? <laughs> <laughs> so he left again, and we don't really know what happened to him other than there was a clan. So I guess he breeded or bred. <laughs> bred. And he um <laughs> he breaded it. He breaded it. He, bredded and... <laughs> he jizzled. <laughs> but all we know about the Immenlocker clan is from, I think, the sacrificial great sword lore. And it just says that they were a clan of brave warriors who fought hard and died young. They believe that combat didn't exist for protection, glory, or territory, but for the amusement of the gods. And yet, as the snow slowly melted and Mondstadt began to take shape, gradually they realized they had found something to fight for at last. So it seems like they were like an important clan in the founding of Mondstadt, but I couldn't find anything that sort of shows that they were like a part of the aristocracy. Because I was like, ooh, maybe they got exiled and that's why we don't know anything about them. What if they went to Conria? You know, like, but I couldn't find anything like that. Now, the Wanderers Troop, Fenia, honestly, that could be its own episode, but that was around during the time of the on night Ragenvinder because he actually got really sort of inspired by a member of that troop and took his name from them uh, and the member of that troop is the one who had the flute weapon by the way mm -hmm. yeah that's why I asked because I was going to bring up the Wanderers troop because they actually they held a rebellion against the aristocracy prior to Vanessa that failed. Yeah. Oh. And that's why the Ravenger was able to meet up with the Wanderer's troop person that inspired them. Yeah, because I think they were probably in jail, right? And Ragenvinder was like talking to them and they they kind of inspired him and like lit a fire under him about the injustice of what was going on in Mondstadt. And just one other, just because you, you brought them up, <laughs> uh, what other really fun <laughs> facts that I, I find about the Wanderers troop, because I'm always looking up Marjavari, is that they are said to have entered Marjavari and performed really? there. Oh. Performed? Yeah, for our travelers who might not remember, Marjavari is the windless place brought up during Venti's storyline, where they say the adventurer Stanley died there. The real Stanley. The real Stanley. And the fake Stanley is like, my friend will never get a proper death because the gods can't even reach him. And even Nahida says that she's never been there. Well, she's also, you know, she's been out of her cage for like six days. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but even Nahida mentions it. So it's very interesting to think that these group of people who have said to have possibly performed in this unenterable place where even Venti's winds can't reach... Had a failed rebellion. Who were they performing to? <laughs> Their foes. Anyone who would listen? No. <laughs> They're quote unquote foes. But <laughs> well, I mean, maybe that's the Temple of Silence. Maybe or really wasn't so silent when they were playing. <laughs> or when they brainwashed Sino. <laughs> maybe that's when they when they made the rule. Silence. They they these guys suck. <laughs> the temple heard their their music and were like they were like, yeah, no, like nope. Silence. Mm -mm. <laughs> like we're done with this shit. Bye bye. <laughs> On that note, get it? But um because oh, Jesus. My God. Is this is what we've become? <laughs> Season three <laughs> is dad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> gotten rid of the buttholes and now we're in the dad jokes <laughs> who said we're done with buttholes the you buttholes have yet. not been a theory at <laughs> all this well, season that's that's true. We should and we back. are now halfway through our season halfway through our season three does that mean we have to bring butts back no yes we do yeah, yeah. i mean we could talk about butts just it's also got to have a dad joke in it because or else it's not going to be in theme. they may have left for y'all but not for me <laughs> <laughs> Well, on that note, I do think that's all the time that we have for today. I cannot believe how much we learned not only about Jean, but things surrounding Jean. It's a lot of interesting Monsat backstory, and I feel like despite how many episodes we do about a Monsat character, we still learn something new every single time. Travelers, thank you for learning with us and coming down to ye old Monstat slash ye old Decarabian's lair. 
or whatever it's called. If you like this episode or you want to let us know what you want to see in the future, please feel free to send us an email, talesoftavatpod at gmail.com. You can also give us a follow on Tales of Tavat, that's Twitter, or Tales of Tavat Pod on Instagram. Also, if you like us, please, please, please go ahead and give us a rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever else you listen to your podcast. It really helps other travelers find us and get to learn things and hear our retractions too. <laughs> but that and means... Feeney's dad jokes. And my dad jokes. Don't you want everyone to hear my dad joke? Don't you want to hear about <laughs> buttholes? You want to hear about buttholes, whatever it is. <laughs> Albedo, cataclysis, the yeah. cataclysis. <laughs> cataclysi or the conaria. <laughs> so if you want to learn nothing, rate us so other people can also <laughs> learn nothing. <laughs> that being said, safe journeys, travelers. We'll see you next time. Bye, dance mom nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Abby is proud. Oh my goodness. <laughs>